Okay, so thank you for joining us. You are in breakout session two, room five, and it is Digital Leadership 2.0, using digital instruction to build a flipped classroom and increase student and family engagement. And your presenters today are Ramona Esparza and Gerald Horn, and I will let them take it away. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you being here. Here is the link for the attendance. I think that's what shows on my Google form. So hopefully that doesn't take you to fill out attendance for me. Um, but if you need that again, that's the Google form attendance sheet. And today I'm going to work from a Google doc. And so I will share the Google doc with you. There's the link to the Google doc. Feel free to, uh, to open that up and follow along. You can even copy it into your drive and then you'll have all the resources in your drive to come back and visit later. Uh, there's a lot in there that we're not gonna explore today, but it's just kind of referenced. And so you are welcome to do that. And I don't think we have so many people that I need another copy of the, the Google Doc. Sometimes when you get over about 30 people or so, then uh, Google Doc starts to shut down and it won't let any more people in. But uh, I think we should be fine today. Anybody having trouble with that? No, nope, looking good. Okay, great. Well, uh, my name is G uh, Jerry Bourne. I am the principal of Odyssey Charter School and I've been there for about 10 years. Uh, Odyssey is a CCSD sponsored charter school and we've been doing blended learning for 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, K through 12, we started as a K through five school that provided a homeschooling curriculum and our teachers would go into the homes of students and deliver instruction one on one with the student and the parent. And we quickly expanded to a K through 12 model that was back in the year 2000, 2002, 2003. And um, and then over time, we became more and more popular and we kept growing and growing. And now we have uh, about 2,500, 2,600 students, kindergarten through 12th. We have a building at the corner of Sahara and Jones. And uh, we still do blended learning. Our students come to see us on campus once a week for uh, each school is a little bit different. But in the elementary school, they see their teachers face to face or in today's day and age um, via Google Meet um, for about two to three hours a week. And in the middle school and the high school, they visit with their teachers for about four hours a week. And other than that, they do all the rest of their learning online, uh, asynchronously, by the way. So, which is different from many of the models that we're seeing today where uh, the online learning is, is uh, synchronous. So that's where I'm coming from. I also write uh, curriculum for the Digital Leadership Institute, and that's my official role here today as a representative of the Leadership Institute of Nevada and the Digital Leadership Program. And Ramona is also here with us. Uh, so go ahead, Ramona, and introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Wow, everybody here on a Saturday. I am so impressed. Thank you all for being with us. and. So um, basically, those that don't know me, my name is Ramona Sparza. I served in the school district for 27 years, and I recently retired and excited for my next chapter. I'm working as the vice president of the Leadership Institute of Nevada. And Jerry Bourne, um, I am amazed because I was very privileged to uh, take on the helm of doing the Digital Leadership Institute. And what I've seen so far, it's not about you know, what apps am I using or, you know, how do I log in? All those technical things about digital learning. It's really about culture. And I think even as a former high school principal, um, it really is always about culture. And I was excited to hear the, the student panel today, hearing what the kids had to say. And I love that little fifth grader, I forget his name, um, talking about how his teacher would check in on him and really get to know him as a person. So I think what Jerry's going to share with you, and we're going to have an, a kind of at the end, a little offering for you to think about for uh, yourself and for others, because it's really about building that relationship with our kids and it's what, what engages them the most. So thank you so much for being with us. Great. Thank you, Ramona. Uh, since there's a small group today, if you have a question, just feel free to un unmute the microphone and chime on in. I'd much rather it be interactive than just me presenting. Um, it, it, it's always a little bit ironic to me that I, I might present at a, uh, an event such as this and I'm doing all of the things that I'm talking about not doing in the classroom, which is 
lecturing and just talking to you, but it's hard in this kind of environment, not knowing who is going to show up to do, you know, and in this case, this particular workshop is about a flipped classroom. So if I had the participants in advance, I would have sent you content in advance and said, here, listen to this little podcast or read this little article or, or watch this YouTube video and just let all these things roll around in your head. And when we come to get together today, then I would have kicked things off and then let you take it and run. And it would have been all about you on your needs and what you need to do. And so, um, so I do feel uh, hypocritical is a strong word, but I do feel a little hypocritical sometimes because I'm not doing what I'm advocating for. So, but I did, I did actually try some of the things here. And uh, part of that is by sharing a Google Doc with you that you can copy to your drive and explore on your own time. Um, if something that I say like sparks your, your brain and you're like, oh, I'm going to go there and I'm going to start following links and you end up going down a, a rabbit hole of, of that idea, then good for you. Then something, you know, something sparked your mind and, and off you go. Um, so Jerry, uh, maybe, want, Jerry, before we start, yeah. really quick, could they do in the chat box so I can see it because I'm kind of your co-partner? Where are you and what grade do you teach or and what subject? That would help. Oh. I, I'll, yeah, in the chat box, really, that would be great. And then I'll pass it back to Jerry. Great. Yeah, that, that would be helpful. I can kind of uh, cater my examples maybe and stories to that. So I have uh, three parts in our, our talk today, and I think the time is going to go by very fast. So, uh, so I'll try to hustle through the part one, which is kind of an introduction about where we are. Uh, I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir on this because you're already at a digital leadership summit, but sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming. So, um, you know, as far as everything that's happening in education today and what's going on. So I want to let you know that you have the power to make the changes that you see and, uh, and and we'll talk about that in just a second part two is an example from just this past week over at odyssey of a flipped classroom activity that i want to share with you and uh and maybe it'll apply in in one way or another to what you teach and where you are and then third i'm going to give the time over to you to let you brainstorm ideas ask questions throw out some problems yeah but what a bunch of yeah buts you know the yeah but what about this or yeah but what about that that's fine, throw them out there because if they're gonna get in your way, then I'd rather we deal with them here. So off we go, part one. I like to start with a story, the story of the Lumiere brothers, uh, not, uh, not the candlestick from Beauty and the Beast. Um, the Lumiere brothers were photographers and manufacturers of photography equipment uh, in the late 1800s. Uh, their father was a, a huge uh, innovator and um, inventor of photography equipment, and they picked up the business. And they invented, well, I mean, it, history is a little blurry, you know, when we go back and, and write it, you know, in hindsight, but um, they are credited with producing the first motion picture, the first movie. Uh, again, you can find things that debate that somebody beat them by a couple of years or whatever, but they are pretty much credited with inventing the motion picture. Okay, so they invented the motion picture in five years after they first, about five years after they first showed the world moving pictures, they said, the cinema is an invention without any future. The cinema is an invention without any future. I believe that was in 1905. So they invented this thing. They showed it to people and they went on tours and they, they showed it in, in, in movie houses. Uh, of course, there weren't movie houses at the time, but you know they convert a theater or a lecture hall. And after five years decided it's not going anywhere. And they went back to the, their labs and they continued their work on color photography. And then later on uh, introduced a whole bunch of new techniques for color photography. So good for them. And now we have color photography in part because of their work. But I just find it fascinating that they could not see the application of what moving pictures could become. And the reason is because they were so locked into their own paradigm that a picture captures a single moment in time. Okay, a picture captures a single moment in time. It doesn't tell a story or give a whole bunch of you know, background or this or that. It captures a single moment in time. In the, the, the movies that they, they made, they, they got a movie of uh, the, one of their first ones was of uh, workers 
exiting the factory. So they set the camera up outside the exit and they just got a picture of all the workers just piling out of the factory. And so you see, it, it is kind of like a picture. I mean, a picture could have told that same or described that same moment. Um, and so uh, it wasn't, it took somebody else to realize, well, if the pictures can move, then they can be put together to tell a whole big story. And of course, within just a few years, um, Hollywood was born, Charlie Chaplin was starting his career. Um, so he said that in 1905, Lumiere said that in 1905. And by 1908, there were 30 motion picture companies in Jacksonville, Florida, which was the original Hollywood uh, before moving out to the West Coast. So uh, in just three years, 30 other companies were making motion pictures because they saw the potential in the industry. I tell you this story now because I kind of feel like that's where we are with digital education. Digital learning has so many possibilities, so many tools, so such a wide range of how we can do it. And yet we're still trying to fit it into our current paradigm of how we teach kids. And you are the ones who can make the difference. Um, we are ripe for an educational revolution. And I just wanna go through a couple of things that can, if you're not convinced of that, just a couple of things that, that maybe will help you get uh, uh, convinced. We essentially teach, before COVID, we essentially teach classes the same way that we did back in the early 1900s when the Lumieres uh, invented their motion picture uh, with kids sitting in desks and a teacher at the front of the classroom. So in 120 years, it really hasn't changed all that much. Uh, the society, economy, and culture whose needs that the system was designed to meet, an industrializing nation, an industrializing world, we need to teach workers how to be able to work on uh, an assembly line, how to manage the shops, how to um, you know, uh, uh, vote or how to read so that they can vote in the politics. Those were the things that, uh, that we were trying to do at that particular point in time. And that society really doesn't exist any longer with the current state of, uh, of our access to information and, uh, and uh, learning devices, et cetera. The system has been held artificially in place by governments, local, state, federal governments, um, because they pretty much have a monopoly on education. And so they've held on to um, the, the same structure and have really um, not allowed other people in to come up with different ways of doing it. But that's starting to break down with uh, magnet schools, tech schools, charter schools, the homeschool movement is huge. Uh, even before COVID, homeschooling was uh, increasing rapidly every single year. Uh, now they've, uh, you know, people have figured out pod schools. Oh, I can get together with like four or five other families and just we could hire a teacher just for us. And we can do it the way we want to do it. So now they're doing pod schools, um, increased access to private schools, such as through vouchers or other tax incentives. The system is breaking down this monopoly of government controlled education is it, it, it'll crack soon. At some point in time, it's gonna crack wide open and there's gonna be all kinds of different um, varieties of education out there. But there's pressure from inside the system as well. I mean, that's what the common core movement was. It's we are teaching before that, we are teaching kids too many facts, too much information and not enough critical thinking skills. And Common Core was about, well, let, we got to teach them to think. So we pulled out some of the facts and instead let's go deeper and teach them to think. So Common Core, Next Generation Science and Social Studies Standards, uh, the grading reform um, is you know, trying to turn our current uh, policies on its head. Um, specialized curricula, again, like magnet schools or tech schools, uh, more AP classes in the high school um, to open to high schoolers, college credit classes and programs like that where kids can earn dual credit. It's, 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 it's opening up from the inside and pressure from the outside. Things are going to change here pretty quickly. And of course, COVID, I think, you know, just accelerated all of that. Um, but most importantly, it's our students that are going to insist that the system changes. Students today have control over their content almost the entire, their, their, the entire time that, you know, they're awake. 
Um, if you remember that when we went to go watch TV after school, there are four channels, right? You know, the ABC, NBC, CBS, and whatever the UHF channel was in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I'm from, it was channel 19. You had four options. And if you didn't like something on those four channels, well, then go outside and play. <laughs> so uh, now the kids have so much control over their content. And not only do they have control over what they watch uh, in, in sometimes in a scary way, but they also have the ability to make their own content and put it out there for an audience to see. They want to be active participants in their lives. They're not passive watchers. Um, I have a story from a friend of mine that works at Cirque du Soleil. Uh, he did. He used to work at Cirque du Soleil. He was a marketing director there and was in charge of a couple of shows. And he was uh, telling me about how they're having a hard time getting the millennials to come to their Cirque du Soleil shows. The millennials don't want to come. And Cirque was, uh, was trying to figure this out. Like, what's, why, do, why are the millennials not coming to see our show? And it wasn't that they didn't have the money. They, they had the money. Uh, they just weren't interested. And so they did all kinds of surveying and, you know, as a, as a corporation like that can, and found out that the millennials want to be a part of the show. They want to be the show. They don't want to sit in the theater and watch somebody else do the show. And so even Cirque du Soleil couldn't engage the millennials with all of that spectacle and incredible talent that those performers have, even they couldn't engage the millennials the way that we were able to engage previous generations. Uh, and uh, the generation younger than the millennials are, are even more down that path. Um, so we have an issue. So, you know, here we are teachers standing in the classroom without all the ability to flip and twist and all the costumes and lights and music and fancy stages that rotate around. We're trying to keep our kids entertained and engaged and even Cirque du Soleil can't do it. So we have to think about a different way of doing this. Um, I, I mentioned a book here in the notes, if you're following along in the Google doc, uh, there's one uh, whiplash, how to survive our faster future. Um, they also talk in that particular book, um, well, they talk about how the experts, the people with the information are no longer given the respect or the authority that they used to, because now anybody can get that information. It's all over the place and anybody can find it. And so you, you walk around, you know, professing, you know, I know this or I know that, you know, the younger kids, they kind of shrug and go, okay. <laughs> so, you know, so what? Um, so, uh, so we have to be careful about that. Um, but another great thing that they talk about in this particular book is emergence. And emergence, by definition, is the creation of a system or organization that is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and they use uh, the example of Wikipedia is a, an example of something that, you know, lots of people contribute little bits to, and it becomes this massive, um, useful tool that has since put Britannica encyclopedias out of business or almost out of business. So, um, so, so that's the, the kind of thing. And so the reason I bring that up here is because our students and our teachers have the ability to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. All right, we'll come back to that in just a moment. So we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the Lumieres by trying to fit our new tools, our new inventions, our new mindset into our old paradigms. It's time to look forward and see what we can do with all of this uh, newfound excitement um, and uh, possibilities. So birds, when birds learn how to fly, they, uh, you know, when they're old enough and they're ready and, and they, they can stand on their own and they have the strength, they pretty much get shoved out of the nest, right? And it's like fly or fall to the ground. And then mama bird may go down and pick them up and they try again. Um, and the reason why that works is because birds are meant to fly. They have wings, they have the instincts on how to fly. They know pretty much from birth what they need to do. Um, I'm assuming uh, since I haven't interviewed a bird specifically, but um, they have the support from their parents. They have the modeling from their parents about what to do. And, and so they're meant to fly. And so we can pretty much, you know, give them a shove and, uh, and they'll be successful, if not the first time, the second or the third. Now, of course, children aren't birds. And I, obviously I know that. And they aren't built for flying and we're not gonna shove them out of the nest. But children are built for learning. 
There is no more powerful tool on the planet for learning than a child's brain. They are making wired connections and amongst their neurons like crazy in their every second of the day. Um, even at night, uh, I would tell a story about my oldest right now, but uh, since our time is short, I won't. Um, but uh, I do like to use storytelling in the lessons. I think that it's a, you know, a great way to engage the learners, especially when I talk too long. But, um, but children are wired for curiosity. I think we can agree on that. And yet they often struggle in school. Why is it that an organism that is so wired to learn, so ready to learn, struggles in the school environment? And not everybody does, not every child we know, but many of them do. Um, and yet, and so somehow formalized schooling is limiting the child's ability to use their natural curiosity because children learn by being curious and discovery. There's nothing more fun than discovering something brand new. And you're the one who discovered it and you figured it out for yourself. That is a great feeling, so full of confidence and that kind of learning really sticks in the brain. Um, and yet in a formalized school setting, we often don't allow the students to use their own natural curiosity. We give them the content up front. We say, this is what you're going to do with it. And here are all the parameters. Here's the type of font to use and the size and how many words it has to be. And we just keep layering on you know, restriction, restriction, restriction to the point where they're not, they're not curious about it at all. Um, it kind of goes along with uh, um, the quote from this, this particular book, uh, Grasp, The Science Transforming How We Learn, that learning doesn't have to be unpleasant. And I love it. In, in fact, it works better if it's not. <laughs> That's an obvious statement there. But, um, but yet, it's often something that we don't follow. Um, the no pain, no gain theory is not true about natural learning. Now, if you're memorizing your Spanish vocabulary, I get it. There's some time for that. Or, you know, you need a little bit of background information about something before you can just take off and start running. Yes, there is time for that. But we do an awful lot of that kind of shoveling out of information and very little discovering of information in our school setting. Um, there's a, another great concept in this particular book um, about winnowing that our educational system winnows our students to try to figure out which ones are the worthy students and which ones are the unworthy students. Which ones are worthy of going on to college, which ones are worthy of getting this particular degree, which ones are worthy of taking that class. Um, it's uh, kind of off topic of this particular lesson, but I just found it a powerful notion. And if you, if that's one of the things that you decide to explore later on, the link is there and uh, the book is called Grasp. There's also an app called Blinkist. Anybody know Blinkist? I discovered it just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I put a link to it uh, up on the page before. And what uh, it's a subscription-based app. You pay a yearly subscription, but they go and they take books like this, um, mostly nonfiction books, and they summarize them into 15-minute little audio lectures. And so you can listen to it while you walk the dog or while you're out running or just uh, you know doing the dishes, whatever you might be doing. And that way you don't have to take two, three, four weeks to read the book without, you can still get the, the, the gist of the book by just listening. And of course, if you really like what they're saying in this book and you wanna find out more, you may go and buy the book and, and, and dig into it deeper, but um, it really is a great app for discovering new things. Um, and so some of my information I'm presenting today, I got from this app Blinkist. So I don't get any money if you subscribe to Blinkist. So there's no commission there, <laughs> just, a, just a friendly suggestion. Um, Another book, Strengths Finder 2.0, is talking about how we have to use our strengths in the workplace. And you know, most places, um, you don't lead with your weaknesses; um, you lead with your strengths. And uh, and yet, in the classroom, we often don't allow our students to use their strengths. Again, I would tell a student about my two boys that are in high school, extremely opposite personalities, um, and yet they both struggle in school for different reasons. 
because they're not allowed, um, not always, but they're, they're often not allowed to use their strengths. Um, I'm sure you've heard of that book before, Strengths Finder. So that one's there. And then Thrivers is another, um, and, and remember my point in doing this is that there's a lot of voices that are saying it's time for a change. It's time for something to change. Thrivers, the surprising reason why some students struggle and others shine. And one of the main themes of this book is that we are in a hyper competitive environment. Everything that students, the kids today, this is actually a parenting book. Everything that kids do today, they're asked to compete in. Um, you know, they can't just, uh, they can't just play soccer anymore. Like back when I was, you know, young, soccer was in the fall and basketball was in the winter and baseball was in the spring. And then in the summer we played golf. Do you remember like, like, like we used to do now, if you're a soccer player, you have to do it all year round and you have to be on a competitive team and you have to be advancing through the ranks and you have to have tryouts every single year. It's like these poor kids, my, you know, my other son, well, he would be great at baseball, but he's never actually played baseball because he chose to play soccer when he was younger and had to do that year round. Um, in school too, everything is about achieving and, um, and what it has led to is a lack of compassion and a lack of empathy in our society. And uh, the college, they, they're doing psychological um, surveys and such with our college students now and finding that uh, empathy has severely declined in our culture um, when looking at the younger kids. Other ideas, uh, there's a serious lack of unstructured playtime. If you YouTube uh, search structured versus unstructured play, you'll find a million videos out there and lectures about the importance of having unstructured playtime so that kids can make up their own rules, kids can solve their own problems and not always have an adult directing how play goes. Uh, I received an email last week from Ed Surge K-12. If you happen to get their email, there are about six to eight articles on that email about uh, changing the way we think about education moving forward. And even Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk defined a success in the exact same way. This was an Apple News article. See the, the clickbait um, headline there. Here it is, but you got to click the article to find out what it is that they said. And they said, create more than you consume. If you want to be successful in business and in life, you have to create more than you consume. Your goal should be to create value for everyone you interact with. Any business that doesn't create value for those it touches, even if it appears successful on the surface, isn't long for this world. It's on the way out. And then Elon Musk saying essentially the same thing said, a company has no value in and of itself. It only has value to the degree that it is an effective allocator of resources to create goods and services that are of greater value than the cost of the inputs. And I put that here because I think it applies to education. And I'm beginning to wonder if education and the system we're using is not using up more resources than it's putting out or if it's not you know, creating more struggle than it is creating success. Uh, and I don't really believe that, that, that it's tipped over you know, from the 50-50 mark, but I do think that it's moving in that direction where um, trying to squeeze kids into a fixed system is creating a lot of friction that uh, the system is now trying to overcome and it's starting to wear itself down. Um, the other thing that uh, Jeff said in that particular memo, the article just mentioned is, in what ways does the world pull at you in an attempt to make you normal? How much work does it take to maintain your distinctiveness, to keep alive the thing or things that make you special? Fight for what makes you different. And I think in our, our classroom, sometimes we ask our kids to just all be the same. Just follow the rules, turn in the assignment, just jump through the hoops and be, and be the same. So. We might say that the bureaucracy is the problem, and there's some of our fearless leaders there, uh, the governor, Dr. Jara, uh, Dr. Ebert, and, uh, and I don't mean to, uh, I picked a picture purposefully that shows them smiling, you know, having a good time, because they are out there fighting for us every single day, but they're at the top of all of this bureaucracy. They are more mired in bureaucracy than we will ever be. Like you, I can imagine that Dr. Jara or, or, or Dr. Ebert will wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I got this great idea about how we can better serve kids. And he thinks about it all the way to work in the car. And by the time he gets to the office and he tells the first person, that person says, yeah, that is a good idea. But 
remember that we can't do that because of this, or we can't do it because of that. And then he tells another person and so all the lawyers will never go for that. All the, the unions, we gotta, we'd have to negotiate that with the unions or what about the contracts or state law says this, this, and this. Remember the idea about the, the professional development? Let's do professional development every single week for like 30 minutes instead of just five times a year for the whole day. That was a great idea until somebody figured out that, well, the way that state law is worded doesn't really allow us to do that. So even though it's a great idea, there's a semantic issue with the law. So we got to go back to the old way. I mean, that's the kind of thing that uh, that our leaders have to deal with all the time. And and if they try to change it, they've got to change the entire system and get everybody to go along. So they aren't going to be our saviors here. And besides, we all know that a directive can come down from the top. It can come down from on high. And you as a teacher in the room or me as an administrator in the building, I can follow the letter of the law and be in compliance, but not follow the intent and not really make any difference. Um, and I, I think that um, for some, you know, the, the grading reform is an example of that coming down, you know, that's work going on in CCSD right now. I'm not sure if it's going on up north, but, um, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. And I think that if teachers understood why, they would be on board a little more. And some teachers understand why and some don't. And so, um, you know, and I've got three kids in CCSD. So I see a whole variety of teachers and their responses to, to this directive. But, um, and we'll get there. We'll get there. We just need to explain and, and, you know, and keep having the conversation. But right now, a directive was sent down and it's being implemented in very different ways, some ways that are effective and some that are not. So, um, so my point in saying that is that right here, if you're following along, it's the pictures of the three teachers in the classrooms. That is where the magic happens. That's where the real work is right there. It happens between the teacher and the student. That's where the difference is. And if you're in a classroom or if you're working with kids or if you're working with families or if you're an administrator working with teachers, that's where the magic is gonna happen. That's where the real work is. And so we have the power. That's why the title on part one was the time is now and we are the leading players because we're the ones that are gonna make the difference. It's that concept of emergence the sum of all of the parts is greater, no wait, is that right? Yes, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So um, together we can make this system um, much more responsive and move it into the next age. Anybody wanna make any thoughts or comments on that before I move into my uh, example about uh, what a flipped classroom can look like? Oh, you wanna, I'm sorry, I wasn't, uh, Ramona, were you on the chat? I wasn't paying any attention. Yeah, I'm, I'm paying attention to the chat. There's not a lot of chat chat because I think they were digesting um, and, and following along, but I think it's a good time to pause because there was a lot to process. What, uh, who, would someone kind of anything, like even what he said earlier, what he kind of talked about before, unmute yourself, please. Just share your thoughts. Hi, thank you um, for this opportunity, Ramona and Gerald. Um, First of all, it's always, I, I get it. It's kind of often sometimes like trying to pick teeth in this type of a format and getting people to respond. So I appreciate your patience, um, but also in creating this type of a space to have those difficult conversations or to at least discuss difficult topics, you know? And it's kind of like, ooh, eggshells maybe because I'm presenting on maybe topics that may kind of be hot items such as the green policy. But unless we have space, to have conversations like this, it doesn't really kind of move the needle. So I just wanted to give a shout out for, um, for, for providing this opportunity. Thank you, Tina, I appreciate that. And, and what teachers have done the last two years, just absolute superheroes, every, every single one of them for jumping in there and you know what, our kids need us and they just, okay, I guess I'm teaching online now. <laughs> yesterday I was teaching faith literally yesterday I was face to face today I'm teaching online and just amazing the most resilient people who just obviously love their work and love kids I'll share uh one takeaway thus far that I've gotten uh is 
was in your notes and you pretty much said it in speaking about the Lumiere brothers, um, just you can't fit new tools into an old paradigm. And it's time to make that shift. It's time that we all uh, really embrace the shift because we're not going back. Our, our students aren't, our students are no longer the students that we used to teach. And so we've got to move our cheese to get to where they are. So thank you. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate that. And I love your little TV head. That's hilarious. It reminds me of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Mike TV. <laughs> okay. Good. Hopefully you had a chance to breathe there for a second. And I know that I talk fast, but it's because I get excited about this content and, um, and I don't get the chance to talk to teachers that often. And when I do, and I have a chance to inspire somebody or, or hopefully maybe push the boundaries of what you've done or just open the, the horizon a little bit, I, I don't know. Sometimes I think I bite off more than I should, but I hope you're with me still. Um, I would like to share an example that just happened this last week from one of my fourth grade teachers at Odyssey. And, uh, and I talked just briefly about what the Odyssey model was at the beginning. And I'll just review that because you need a little bit of background so you know how this lesson fits in. Um, in the fourth grade, our, uh, our students do their work in Moodle. Moodle is our um, learning management system, same as Canvas. Canvas is a great tool, fantastic tool. Um, Moodle was just around before Canvas. And so all of our stuff is already locked up in Moodle. Uh, so that's why we use that. Um, and then they meet with the teacher twice a week, this particular teacher, I'm sorry, once a week for two hours. And for years, we struggled with our, our teacher saying, I only see the students for two hours a week. I have to try to teach them everything that they need to know in that two hours. And I said, well, if we can teach them everything that they need to know in two hours a week, then why are we going to school for five days a week for six hours a day? That's, we can't do that. And you're driving yourself crazy. You're stressing out your kids. You're stressing out the families. And we were not serving our students well and our scores were dropping pretty drastically. I said, we have to, to embrace our model. Our model is that we provide instruction asynchronously. And in the elementary school, we ask the parents to be very involved in helping their students with their lessons. In the middle school and the high school, the parents take more of a managerial role. They step back and they just make sure the assignments get done and the communication is good. The grades are where they want them to be. But in the elementary school, we often speak of them as co-teachers. Okay, so that is different from what many of you are dealing with out there in, you know, in, in your districts. And I realize that, all right, but kind of need to know that in, in looking at, at this idea. And this particular lesson isn't necessarily going to fit what you teach. You know, I know, for example, that Sean is here and he's a high school theater teacher. So I'm about to share a fourth grade math lesson. And I realize that that content is not, you know, synonymous. But I'm hoping that you can look at some of the things that are in this lesson and go, OK, that part applies to me. Or, yeah, I can make that jump and transition that over here. And this, of course, is one of the skills that we really struggle with with our students, too. It's like, how do you take the content that applies in this particular lesson, but just because I said over there that you need to use more descriptive language and you have to vary your sentence structure doesn't mean that it no longer applies when we do the next assignment. You still have to vary your sentence structure and use descriptive language, you know? So <laughs> thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's the, the penalty you pay for uh, somebody knowing who you are when you're sitting in one of these. So um you might get called out. Um, so, so anyway, so here, here we are in this particular one. And I've been working with this teacher for several years now on this idea that you have to let go of your face-to-face -face time. It's too important to spend it on tier one teacher direct instruction. Okay, I'll say that again. It's two hours a week is all we have this student that two hours is too important to say we're going to spend that time, the teacher just lecturing the student or demonstrating how to do the skill. You have to trust that the student can learn it in the digital space. Okay. So, yeah, it certainly does. It, re it requires a partnership. But we're going to talk about some ways to help make that happen when we look at this. 
Okay, so this teacher made a huge breakthrough this this particular week, and I'm very proud of her. Um, it's not the most you know ingenious or brilliant um, flipped model uh, lesson ever, but for her, since we've been doing this, you know, working on it for four years, it's really a great step. It's like three steps from where she was before. So I need to get to. I need to share my screen. Share screen. I see it. Um, And Jerry, as you're sharing screen, I know you know we have like five minutes, I think, remaining. Oh, my goodness. I know, but they have the document, which is cool. Doesn't it go to 1130? No, no. 1120. My bad. No worries. Um, let's see. Well, you know what I can do, actually, is I can give you the link to, I think you can log into. Here it is. So it's a fourth grade uh, math lesson. Um, the math lesson is to be done at home. It's multiplied by two digit numbers. And the grading method is the highest grade. So the students can go back and do this lesson as many times as they need to. Are you seeing it? Yep, you're seeing it. Okay, great. Um, she writes with some voice. Why do we need to multiply? We've been learning about many different ways to multiply numbers. The amazing part is there isn't just one way to do it. You may have heard your parents say, why can't we just do it the way we learned it? Well, that is one way we can do it, but there are so many other ways too. And they've been working on this. This is kind of the culminating um, lesson after a couple of weeks of multiplication. So this isn't the first time they're introducing the topic. She includes a math uh, by Mr. J video. Mr. J makes great math videos out there, very clean and precise. Um, no need to reinvent the wheel if the tool's already out there. But then look at our example here, math at a carnival. And here she says, you know, a fun example with a great picture about we can figure out how many uh, uh, prizes there are by using an array. Okay, and she walks them through how to use an array. And then she says, go ahead and try it. And she noticed that she gave them all the examples or all the parts of the array. And at this point, all they have to do is multiply and add them up. Um, the funny little thing, don't look below this funny picture until you solve the problem. And in this case, she solved it for them. But Here's another example with bouncy balloons uh, and bouncy balls and water balloons. And this time, after she solves an example, we switch up the numbers and now the kids have to do it. Okay, so they, uh, they make their, their, their guess. And if they guess wrong, it gives them a hint as to how to guess, how to get right. And then they get a couple of different chances to do it. Um, and she goes through uh, like this um, repeatedly through different really clever examples um, different types of questions. And, um, and so she can look in her grade book um, to see who has done it. And she sends an email out at the beginning of the week saying the, the, uh, this particular lesson is really important for your small group this week. Um, and I'm going to tell you why in just a sec. So, um, so anyway, so she goes through this and uh, different examples, and each one gets a little bit more complicated. We would have taken a little more time if I didn't talk so long before. But she does turn, and they do a PBLs, and at the very end of the lesson, she connects it to their PBL, which is uh, about being a president for a day and writing an executive order. It's a social studies-based PBL, but she does link it into their PBL about what room is uh, the largest in the White House and can you figure out the area of the White House. So I thought that that was, that was really clever. So now let me come back to you. And um, I was trying to find where you all went and how to stop sharing the screen. Oh, that's it. So at the at the um, so then she asks the kids to create your own multiplication problem that you are going to bring to class and share with your small group. The kids can share their, their, their multiplication problem with the, the small group and all of the kids in the group then solve that particular multiplication problem in whatever way that they do it. Because she talked about using estimation, partial, partial products, using the algorithm, um, a couple of other different ways to, to solve the problems. And so the kids can choose their own way to solve it. They talk about it, which is you know, very math talky, right? Those uh, math talks. And then... Um, and then the next kid presents their problem and then they all talk about it. So the lesson that normally would have been heard demonstrating how to do these problems in different ways now becomes all about the kids solving their own problems. Um, and she can watch and listen and get an assessment grade based on what she observes instead of giving them a five question quiz 
which is what normally happens. They normally get a five question quiz. So now it's an authentic real assessment and it's a way for students to show they understand the concept without having to take a multiple choice question quiz because maybe not everybody's very good at that. So now they have another way of taking an assessment. Um, so uh, and now some kids will show up without having done the assignment. And after doing this about two or three weeks, this kind of work, the kids are going to figure out really fast, you know, if I do my homework, then I get to have a lot more fun when I come to class, as opposed to just sitting there listening to everybody else get to present. I don't get to present because I didn't have one. It's not a punishment. It's just you didn't you didn't bring a problem to present. So, OK, you know, next time they will do their homework and be prepared because now they get to participate in the engaging activity um, you know, that they get to share their own work. Okay, kind of see how that how that works. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we have to wrap it up. There yep. is a survey link, a session survey link in the chat. Please take a couple minutes and fill that out for us. And then I'm putting some information here in the chat as well. We are this next uh, session is actually lunch. We get a little bit of a lunch break here in the middle of the day, uh, middle of our session, our digital learning summit. And then please remember that our session three starts promptly at 11.55. And then remember to refresh your uh, Canvas link, your schedule page, so that you have the most up-to-date information. And thank you so much for, for being here. And thank you, Gerald and Ramona, for uh, doing that wonderful presentation. Thanks. Good luck, everybody. I'm rooting for you. <laughs>